over the uh, hubbub here for a minute. And we're going to get started with our uh, three projects coming next. For those of you who are here who did not know about the class action lawsuit, I want to go through the timelines because it was really important. 2007, 2008, we started talking about a class action lawsuit. Um, Marie, Patricia, Marilyn and myself, and a lawyer from London, a law firm called Siskins. Her uncle had been in Woodlands in British Columbia, and uh, she knew what went on in institutions, and she was very keen to take the case. Unfortunately, that lawyer could not stay on the case because one of the partners was taking a position with the government of Ontario. So they thought it might be a conflict of interest and uh, we were passed on to Kosky Minsky, which had both its um, good side and very much a downside. So from 2008 until 2010, we prepared the case. 2010, nine years ago now, the case was certified that summer. Then, three years from that point in time, September 2013, we're now five years in, we were prepared to go to court. The day we were at the court, the lawyers told us that the case would not be heard, that they were going to accept a settlement with the government. We looked at the settlement that the lawyers brought to us and there were almost 20 points in it that they had told us would not be in it or were points that were left out that they had told us would be in it. We brought back that lawyer from London to help us resolve the issue and basically we're in a fight with our own lawyers to get things in the settlement that we felt very strongly should be there. So two weeks later, the lawyers signed the settlement for Heronia. The plaintiffs, the litigation guardians, never saw the final draft and never signed it. The lawyers from Kosky Minsky did that. So that's now September of 2013. In February of 2014, half a year later, the Rideau and Southwestern lawsuits were added on to the Heronia lawsuit. So it was a combined uh, three lawsuits, except there were distinct differences between the Heronia settlement and the other two um, class actions. Early in April of 2014, the claims forms were mailed out. That was now four years after certification. And finally, at the end of August 2015, a year and a half later, checks were mailed out to people. So this was a long process. Part of the settlement for Heronia and Rito and Southwestern was an addendum called uh, uh, Part D of the process. And it had some extra uh, points in it that provided the money for what you're seeing here today. Um, and I want to, because that became a dispute too, I want to mention a woman who helped us greatly. We went to, uh, back to the judge to get the projects approved. The government, um, uh, as far as Kosky Minsky were concerned, could approve all the, all the projects. And we were adamant that the survivors had to have a say in what projects uh, would be approved. And we went to the judge, the four of us, and told that to the judge. And the judge very generously allowed us to appoint a lawyer who would speak on behalf of the survivors and fight for survivors' rights to say what projects would be funded. Her name is Yasminka Kalaidic. Yasminka is a professor at the law school in Windsor. She basically took on our case and our issues uh, simply for expenses. She did not ask to be paid. 
She has just written this book, Class Action in Canada. She is the expert on class action lawsuits. Uh, if you wanted to know more about class action lawsuits, you might look into it. So the funds, and they amounted to $7.4 million, uh, $4.7 million from Heronia, and $2.7 million from Rideau and uh, Southwestern were grouped together, and then we had to uh, dispute with the lawyers um, which uh, projects would be funded. I mentioned earlier there were 80 submissions. They averaged about 50 pages each. We had 4,000 pages of submissions to read and look at. Some of them we could throw out really quickly because there were about 40 of them that were government agencies asking for money to keep doing what they were already doing. And Yasminka very clearly explained the Cypre concept, and that is that money that isn't given to survivors but is still left over has to go to benefit survivors. So we owe a huge debt of gratitude to Yasminka for ensuring that the projects you're hearing about today um, actually received the funding. So without um, taking any more time, because we've got to move along here and see if we can make up a few minutes, uh, th three presentations here. Family Alliance of Ontario, which received $740,000 for their project. Community Living Kingston, which received $46,000 for their project. And People First of Ontario, who received $2,400,000 for their project. Please introduce yourselves. Go ahead. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, the presentation panel for our project will be, uh, we'll first introduce ourselves, then we're going to tell you a bit about, in 10 short minutes, our inspiration for the project, some of our goals, and some of, our des some of the desired outcomes for the project. My name is Cindy Mitchell. I'm president of Family Alliance Ontario, um, short FAO. Um, FAO is uh, an organization in Ontario that has been around for almost 30 years. We are an organization that was created by families and we are led by families. We are an organization that doesn't offer any programs or services. We are an alliance of citizens who offer knowledge, tools, networking opportunities to people with disabilities, their families, their, their friends, and citizens in local communities. We offer freely given family-to-family -family networking and support. And we offer support to our affiliate family networks across the province. We offer support to help them learn and grow, and we learn and grow from them. Currently, as I said, we have 23 affiliated family networks and groups. FAO was one of the successful applicants for, for, for funds from the class action lawsuits. Our application and our project is called Uncovering the People's History from Asylum to Community, a Participatory Action Project. I'm Joyce Bellas, and I'm a family home provider to Bill, a longtime member of Family Alliance Ontario, and currently serve as the chair of the steering committee. Hi, I'm Bill. I helped develop the project. I am a survivor. I lived at Christopher Robin for five years, and this is where I was kept. I wanted out and banged my head. This is how they listened. So it's a crib cage, and then Bill with the helmet on. Uh, that was the way that they solved uh, his desire to. So um, I'm speaking for Bill. My name is Arn. Um, Bill was rescued uh, two years before the 15 deaths at Christopher Robin home, so he was quite fortunate. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Vicki Clark. I am um, uh, working as the project coordinator, uh, humbly and gratefully to be working with the fantastic 
uh, leadership of Family Alliance. However, more importantly, um, my brother Rob is a survivor from three institutions, one including Rito. As a result of hearing about the Heronia class action uh, certification hearing um, in March 2010, my brother Rob wanted something done about Rito. As a result of that and many conversations, David McKillop, who is here, stand, um, agreed to be the uh, representative plaintiff for the thousands of people who lived at her, uh, survived at Rito, and speaking up for people whose voice would not be valued or wouldn't be, um, <clears throat> yeah, wouldn't be valued in a court of law to, due to how they're communicating. So. Uh, that's it. Oh, oh, yeah. <laughs> As Bill's intervener, I'm uh, speaking. Wait, oh, sorry. As Bill's intervener, I'm here to help uh, Bill's vo voice be known. Bill was adamant that he wanted to attend court, the court case. He wanted to support the survivors at all the court proceedings as a survivor himself. So now we're, we're just sharing some of the inspirations that um, sparked us in, in, in developing this project. So Bill and I were moved by the Ryerson Disability Studies uh, Project out from under exhibit. We first saw it in 2008 when we were in Ottawa for the uh, 50th anniversary of Community Living, Canadian Association for Community Living. Um, and we saw it there, and then we saw it again maybe three or four years later in London. And at that time, we had become more involved in the class action suit, and we also had known that part of uh, Cindy's history is part of that project, and that really touched us. From the, so many of us, many of us, FAO, our friends, our family, uh, and friends attended many of the court proceedings. We were profoundly impacted hearing some of the stories. And uh, personally, I was profounded, profoundly impacted by the process and the outcomes of the process, you know. A key one being, you know, due, due to the, the challenging, and I would say flawed claims process, many survivors would not be successful in receiving compensation, thus leaving leftover funds that went to the community projects, like, like what you're hearing about what we're doing. FAO, you know, from attending there, um, we had a, um, a, an AGM and uh, a gathering of our family networks in the fall and September of 2016. And we were lucky enough to have a couple survivors um, attend and, and give a presentation. So sitting as a mom, you know, of a woman who is 34 and a mom of uh, a child who died in an institutional setting. I sat and I watched a young mom across the room listen to Bev and Betty's story. And I saw the mom cry and I saw her teenage daughter cry. And I, her, her daughter, who I know is a, a, a young woman with a, an intellectual disability, she wasn't there at that time. But I saw them cry and I thought, Oh my goodness, oh my goodness, young families need to hear this. People need to hear this in communities across Ontario. Um, and who better to tell the history than survivors and their families. And what, what a great position we were in as a provincial family network connected to family networks across Ontario to invite those family networks to be part uh, you know, of our project. So Bill and I were deeply moved um, when we had the chance to experience a blanket exercise which talked about the colonization of our indigenous brothers and sisters. And we thought this would be something that we could maybe get out there to people so that they could um, hear the stories and learn about the harm that was done in the institution. So we included that part as one of our outcomes in our project. So not unlike the hurt and the harm experienced by our indigenous peoples due to their removal from their communities and the segregation of their children in residential schools, survivors of Ontario's institutional care model system experienced deep, deep hurt and harm. And um, they were separated and congregated and moved away from their communities. 
These hurts and harms most significantly impacted um, them, first and foremost, but they also impacted families who, who were encouraged to give up their children. Um, it impacted siblings. It impacted, it impacted the communities because the communities didn't get to enjoy their, their gifts and contributions. They were missing. They were lost. People were lost to this harmful practice of congregation and segregation, movement away from their communities. And this still happens today, folks. You've heard much about this. Many people before us have been saying this. And, but it's more subtle today. We have to be alert to it. So we may not even recognize it in some of our shiny new um, day programs. We may not even recognize it in some of our you know, so-called inclusive living situations, which really are congregated, segregated, but just shiny new. Yeah. People need to understand that harm. Families need to understand that far harm. For me, young families need to understand that harm. My adult sons and, and daughters-in-law without disabilities need to understand that harm. Our communities need to understand that harm. Our project wants to hear those stories. So the project on covering the people's history is exactly what we're talking about, is to reach out to communities through our local family networks to reach people who haven't really had the opportunity to share their stories and also for people to discover and have the conversations to, to uh, discover if there are stories within their family or their, their networks or their communities. We've had um, currently the, the project goals are to have six community gatherings across Ontario and in addition to that two healing retreats. Um, the, the way we're doing this is local family networks have said, yes, we want to participate. We are interested in doing this. So we're, we've connected and we're working with the Durham Family Network, Muskoka Family Network, Thunder Bay Family Network, and um, wait, London, London, sorry. <laughs> oh, dear. <laughs> so, we were, um, so we're in the process of doing that. And through the, the leadership at the local grassroots level with those, the family networks, we are um, engaging and working with them to figure out what makes sense for their community. What makes sense in a way to uncover those stories. Um, and, and a part of that process is, is locally we're, we're engaging with a local story facilitator that the family networks will find somebody in their community who will find people who want to share their stories. And from that will come, will come the community gatherings. After the gatherings and after um, we have our, the, the stories of people who want to share them, the, a traveling exhibit is to be developed. The exhibit, the intention, as Cindy was saying, we need to get the word out. People need to hear about the harms of in, the institutional model, uh, care model. And the idea is those, you know, those exhibits you see in libraries or in city halls or in schools, that's what's going to... Um, at the end of the project, that will be one of the concrete things that will stand uh, uh, and will be able to continue to hold that history. It's okay. Oh, one little small piece. Um, it's really important to provide a, a place for hidden stories to come to light with open conversation. Um, the first thing that drew me to the court class action um, court case was very personal. Growing up, um, I heard like quietly in the background about a great, great aunt who was sent away to some place and the name was never revealed of that place, but I, I, I believe it's Huronia. Um, my mother knew, you know, it would have been her aunt, my mother's aunt. Um, my mother came with me to the, the court proceedings, my sister did, because we heard about this person who, who was not spoken about in our family, and we could not believe that, that a person could be sent away and not spoken about, and we could not know that person. Allowing people to share stories and doing it in a safe way can help overcome some of that shame and blame and hurt associated with institutionalization with some families. This is what we're hoping. 
Um, and we're hoping through the engagement of family, local family networks that family networks can come to meet people who live in their very communities who they might not have had the privilege to get to know. So part of it is, is yep. also... Uh, one minute to wrap it up, please. Okay. Family so Alliance, thank you. Quickly, um, part of the important part is we're trapping into uh, local resources, and we want to make sure that our, our people who are telling our stories aren't just sort of telling their stories and being left alone. So um, part of it, um, once we talk about launching the project, uh, the, the actually traveling exhibit, that exhibit will go back to the communities that created the stories, and we will enlist the help of People First Ontario, our local family networks, and... Um, the steering committee members, things like that. We have an advisory group as well. We're going to encourage those people and to be part of that um, curation of that exhibit, so that um, it just doesn't. It's not just sitting there and people just have to look at it. We want really to walk people through the exhibit. And um, with that, hang on, <laughs> Vicky. We need to give you a chance to talk about what it means to your family. Um. <clears throat> Uh, so, what this means to Rob and my mom and I and our larger family is that, so I grew up in a household of active advocacy. My mom actually is, and some of you are in the audience, involved back in the early, late 60s, early 70s, sorry to age some of us, for closing institutions, for getting supports for families, for families to have a voice. However, through that time, never, there have been very few times where families and people felt, other than maybe in the People First movement, the freedom and, and to speak the truth about what happened. This project, for me personally, respects families, respects people who've been through, the, as Joe said, that hell on earth. Um, and it's that, that deep uh, walking with people through the shame through the, this is a piece of the history that we didn't even talk about. People didn't want to hear about it, quite frankly. I mean, Jim and Marilyn, will, and we can talk about how hard it was to crack the media. Peter involved with People First for years about how hard it was to get people. I mean, closing of institutions has been People First's mantra since 1977. So, so for, as a sister, as a sister who, who grew up, Listening to the stories of people, I just think that this project and the opportunity for families to come together, it's, it's, and, and people, it's releasing the shackles of shame and history. So, um, thank you. David? Okay, we're gonna have to move on. Uh, Community Living Kingston, please. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'd like to thank the organizers of Flying to Freedom for giving Community Living Kingston the opportunity to present the reclamation project, The Value of Living Life at the Helm. Although you will see that the presentation is a comprehensive project about institutions and a platform for people to share their stories about experiencing life in and after these institutions, it has a far deeper message. If we look at the title, the value of living life at the helm. It really is about why living in one's own community is the best way for everyone to live. It's about the value of having all of the rights of citizenship, choice, and autonomy in our lives, and why we must never return to that model again. It is ultimately about what is the better choice, and it's ultimately about choice. The Reclamation Project set out to achieve three goals. The first and main goal is to give a platform for people to tell their stories. The people who lived in these institutions are aging. During our past year of production, two of our contributors have passed away. And this confirms the importance of capturing as many stories as possible before they're lost forever. The second goal of our project is to give a complete 
picture of what institutions are like. Covering their history from beginning to end, what they were like, and what life was like inside them. About giving the changing medical, cultural, and societal attitudes throughout this time. And the third goal is to show the comparison between life and institutions and life living at the helm as a full citizen for as philosopher George Santayana said, and Joe did too, those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. So there are, oh, who is our intended audience? <laughs> so who do we want to share this project with? We want to share this project with colleges and universities so that students who will one day work in the social and developmental services sector have a firm understanding of the past and present and why we must keep moving forward. We uh, just yesterday heard from uh, St. Lawrence College, who is now going to use our project in their behavioral psychology programs in two of the classes, and Seneca College, uh, also in their social services program, is going to be using our project as well. We also want to share the, uh, the project with agencies as a tool to train staff that support people who once lived in institutions, and for these same support workers to always be mindful of leaving these institutional attitudes and practices in the past. And we want to share this project with ministry officials who make decisions and write policies on behalf of people with intellectual disabilities so that they can make informed choices that keep society forever moving forward. Businessman Michael Margo once said, the stories we tell literally make the world. If you want to change the world, you need to change your story. This truth applies both to individuals and institutions. So the project has three components. There is a PowerPoint presentation that provides a comprehensive overview of institutions. There is a website filled with first-hand accounts from people who lived in institutions and were involved in institutional life. And there is a documentary video highlighting interviews with several of these people. Each component not only provides a description of life in institutions, but also compares institutional life to living life in the community. We hope that no one will ever have to experience the words of Maya Angelou when she said, there is no greater agony than bearing an untold story inside you. Let's take a closer look at these three components. In the PowerPoint presentation, we learn about the history of institutions from beginning to end and why they came to be. We learn about the changing societal, cultural, and medical attitudes throughout this time. And we learn what life was like inside these institutions. The PowerPoint presentation is about 45 minutes long, but we have separated it into four teachable segments so that a teacher can take it into the classroom and easily present it to their students. We've also included a teaching tool using these four segments to teach specific outcomes along with questions, exercises, topics of discussion for each section, and recommendations for further study. At the end of each slide, there is a relevant quote from a project contributor or a pertinent figure in history. In one of these quotes, Don Bodichon, who lived at Southwestern Regional Center, tells us that everyone should know what went on in there. This is a sample page from the PowerPoint presentation, talking about some of the reasons for institutions. So when people see our PowerPoint presentation, they'll get a really good understanding of the reasons why institutions opened, the history of them, and everything about life inside of them. The website for the Reclamation Project, The Value of Living Life at the Helm, is online already, so you're welcome to go and take a look right now. It can be found at www.thereclamationproject.ca. The home page of the website describes the history and uses of the Reclamation Project, so what I've already explained to you. It gives a brief description of the three largest institutions and talks about the website, the power of storytelling, and the rest of the website is dedicated to telling stories. So far we have 34 stories. 14 of those are from people who lived in institutions. Most of the stories are written as first-hand accounts and some are written anonymously. 
Joe has shared his story on our website. Thank you, Joe. David McKillop has also shared his story on the website. Stories are also shared by family members who had family members and loved ones who lived in institutions. There are some stories of staff that worked in institutions and how they felt about their jobs in that role. Planners who helped people to move out of the institutions and establish homes in the community have also been interviewed. And for comparison, we have stories from people with intellectual disabilities whose parents made the choice to not have them institutionalized so that we can see the difference of the power of one choice. The Reclamation Project website is a living document and will continue to add stories for as long as there are people who want to share them. So please let us know if you have a story or know of someone who would like to share one. Because as Gary Warren once said, a movement is not permanent. Okay. So to spark your interest in reading the stories, I have a couple of story samples. I won't go through them all because I've been given the one minute warning. But there is a story there and I'll just share this one with you. Kevin Hutchinson lived in Southwestern Regional Center and he wrote a five page story that sounded very much like a Dr. Seuss novel. After um, he was finished, he presented his story to the Deputy Minister of Community and Social Services in 1992. And after reading Kevin's story, the Deputy Minister stopped the use of shock prods as a behavioral modification technique in institutions. So in his story, this is just a little part of it, it says, if you were tied to a chair or a bed, you have very big blisters, and you wouldn't do this to your brothers and sisters. You wouldn't do this to your mothers and brothers, so why do it to all the others? So please read. So the third part of the Reclamation Project is a documentary video. This video was produced with Seneca College, their media department. We are extremely grateful for them. They have generously donated their time and resources to help us create a professional video. The video, so far, it's not completed yet, but it's over 30 minutes in length and highlights the stories of 13 of our project contributors. David McKillop is also on our video and shares his song that you're about to hear on as well. And then there is the story of Patricia Hamilton. She's a person who we've highlighted who was not put in an institution. Although in 1924, when she was born with severe spastic cerebral palsy, that was par for the course to be put in an institution. She grew up at home with her parents and her family in Westport, Ontario. She lived a full life and at one point was even the Westport Catholic Women's League president. And today, at the age of 95, she is the livest, olding livest per, living person in Canada who has cerebral palsy. As Steve Jobs once said, the most powerful person in the world is the storyteller. The storyteller sets the vision, values, and agenda of an entire generation that is to come. The stories told in the Reclamation Project, the value of living life at the helm, and the stories collected in projects like this will ultimately set the vision, the values, and the agenda for many generations to come. Thank you. People First of Ontario. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Justin Marr, and I'm the second vice president of People First of Ontario. Um, people First is a self-advocacy group with people with intellectual disability. Now I'm gonna now I'm gonna try to get used to this as well. Um, my name is Corey, uh, Corey Earl, and I'm uh, the past president for Peel versus Ontario, um, and also the chair of this uh, project committee as well. Okay. Um, my name is uh, my name is uh, Michael Madden. I'm the uh, central area rep for People First of Ontario. Um, my role involves um, going around chapters, um, connecting with them, and um, 
also to help build up new chapters as well so we can expand our movement. Um, we're still 37 years and going strong. So, <clears throat> and um, we're here to talk about the uh, label jars, not people. So, um, Corey, you can take this from here. Okay, so we'll, um, we're going to uh, get into ta and talk about the investment and, uh, and all kinds of things that uh, PFRS has been doing um, around that and, um, and uh, we'll continue to do that. The investment will ensure that PFRS of Ontario, um, Ontario, Ontario's sub sustainability and provide leadership and mentorship for local people first groups in Ontario in the coming years. And I can honestly say through uh, the investment, um, uh, over, over five local chapters have opened in the province of Ontario in the past year. Um, part of the investment is also, um, and, and part of it, what we did is met um, with Windsor Essex Community Foundation to invest uh, $2 million to, um, to make sure that uh, the sustainability for years to come. Um, <clears throat> and uh, so we um, were went there to um, as well. What if, um, and another thing that we've been doing as well as part of the advocacy is, um, and part of this entire project has been to hire contractors as well, um, <clears throat> project coordinator and administrative assistants to be able to help us to be able to carry out the work as well. And also that was part, and part of that was to also increase our advisors at one point um, through the movement, we actually only had two advisors, and now actually we have four. So, uh, so we've been able to increase that um, as well. <clears throat> we've been able to provide board training, um, and board training and responsibilities and role has been really, really huge for our members. Um, like, uh, and I know Justin will talk, but but this week, I mean, we'll have the presidents from local chapters actually come to Wagasaga Beach um, to actually have an opportunity to learn and to talk about um, their area, but provide uh, leadership skills of uh, board development as well. So we, uh, so for the first for, for the first time, we're able to do that, um, and it'll be just the local presidents uh, um, of the chapters, um, uh, governance roles, responsibilities as well. Um, also organized our annual general meeting and conferences, uh, which this year it is uh, October 4th in Woodstock this year. And one of the things that um, the part of it is we threw it back to a local chapter to be part of that and to help organize instead of it being always in one area. So this time a local chapter will actually take the lead on that and we'll support them and guide them. Um, we've actually held several board meetings over the past uh, year as well to talk about the issues uh, in person and by conference call. Provide training, um, development to members across this province, increased number of members. You know, I was just in Kingston just last week and excitement about local chapter launching and about people coming. This guy, um, you know, talked about his story and said, I, um, and it, broke down and said, I'm scared what's going to happen tomorrow because what has happened from my supports, they would tie me to the wheelchair and they would chain, chain me to the wheelchair. And, um, and while we comfort that, um, you know, spoke to management and all that, the person was truly scared about that, but that was the first time he was able to get that off his shoulders and be able to talk about that. And, and now we're working very closely. So. That's one of many stories um, that uh, we've been hearing. Um, also provide training to advisors and local chapters. Uh, we've attended many government meetings, of course, over time. And part of the things that we've actually added here is we are going to be going around the province to hear from survivors, because we want to make that fundamental part of what we do. Um, and quite frankly, People First has always recognized that, but we want to, we ought to do better and, and provide that. Uh, people really need to, uh, to hear directly from that, um, as Joe mentioned, uh, you know, hell on earth, and I think that should be a saying across the boards so of governments here that as well, um, and uh, and have people be part of the conversations. We actually just met with the government of Ontario not too long ago, not the minister, but the government of Ontario to talk about institutions and the recommendation that we actually um, 
Institutions should not reopen again. There has been uh, public apologies for the mistreatment and abuse that people endured. It continues to affect people's lives. The nightmare of some people's lives, past will never, will never leave them. It is important that the government join with us in denouncing any new institutions and their horror of the past. Our recommendation to the government uh, about a month ago was that the government of Ontario join with people first in denouncing any new institutions, providing people with the tools and resources to live a better life in the community. No response yet on that. <laughs> um, so we, we, did, we did reach out two weeks ago and ask for a response on that. Um, and part of the goals um, that we have, as mentioned earlier, but a strong board of directors. Uh, this board has changed over the course of years. I'm sure Peter will relate to that, has changed dramatically over the years. But we really need to fundamentally look at the uh, board of directors. People also being heard as well and supported. Share more information. Building capacity has been huge. And responding to issues that truly affect and whether it be uh, institutions, um, we know um, a lot of our members are, are really affected by segregation education as well, that's, um, and many other things. Um, involve more young people to be part of this as well. And also, our huge one is the interview, as I mentioned, uh, people with, um, who lived in institutions as well. Also, this committee is all about transparency as well to overseeing it, um, the project. The membership of the committee, of course, would be myself, the executive uh, board member, hire contractors, and members who have experienced a living institution to help continue to move that journey forward. So, thank you. So, um, David um, McKillop, could you come up and um, prepare now? Nope. There's still some more. Um, meantime, John Guido, you have an announcement to make while David is setting up. Just want to share for, on behalf of Madeline Burkhart, uh, who led one of the projects uh, with Large Toronto that Joe Clayton, in fact, was part of with uh, siblings and survivors sharing their stories to educate people. Madeline is teaching today at uh, the Disabilities Program at King's College at Western University, but her, uh, she's published a book that's made accessible some of her work. The book is called Broken Institutions, Families, and the Construction of Intellectual Disability. Despite the title, this is a more accessible version of her, of her doctoral studies. Uh, at York University that is really designed to share some of this ex lived experience of family members as well as survivors and the impact in their lives and uh, related to the underlying social understanding that led to the institutionalization in the first place. So the very important work. I have a few copies available today for $20 or a uh, discount code and I highly recommend it. This is a song called Lord, Carry Me Away. I think David wanted to say something first and then he'll, he'll perform his song. I'm David McKillop. I'm one of the survivors from Rita Richard. Without Vicki, I thank her for helping me out. And Joe Clayton, I understand what you mean. Keep up the good work. Some people say I could be Some people say I am dumb But if you spend some time with me You will find I'm feeling free and low Carry me away I 
shirt today. I don't care what people say They wish it me anyway They treat me good, they treat me bad They make me blue, they make me sad Lord, carry me away Carry me away For I had done my share today Lord, carry me away For I had done my share today Lord Carry me away For I had done my share today Lord, carry me away For I had done my share today For I I done my share today Thank you and Corey, people from Ontario. Thank you, David McKillop. And so people from Ontario, thank you for inviting me in from your group. And I enjoy every bit of it. Thank you. Great. Thank you to uh, Family Alliance, Community Living Kingston, and People First of Ontario. Um, Susan has um, some handouts, brochures. Uh, I have read uh, those stories that they've produced so far, and they are really well worthwhile reading. I think we need about a 15-minute break. Uh, before we resume again. So we'll meet back here in 15 Jim, minutes Jim. at uh, 20 after 3. Jim, Jim, we also have... Sorry, um, come up, come up here. Use the microphone. <laughs> use, use the microphone right there. Oh, sorry. All there you go. There you go. Done. We also brought our plain language copy of our proposal for anyone that would be, that would be helpful for you to read it. Wow. Yeah. 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 You want to leave?